Let's start looking at the case study, which is this expression tree processing app. And you'll understand sort of what problem it's trying to solve. You'll understand some of the behavioral properties and structural properties in the domain of expression trees, which should be very familiar to you if you've taken the data structures course or an algorithms course before it at Vanderbilt or elsewhere. So uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, when this course began, from my experience, and this goes back, you know, 25 to 30 years, learning about patterns, learning about programming is not best discussed by just talking in the abstract. Yes, it, it helps to talk about things in the abstract, and we'll do some of that. Um, but it's really much more effective to, to do it and do it in a real world context. So I'm going to show you how to apply patterns and C++ and STL features and frameworks in order to build a, a very non-trivial program and to do it in a way that's way easier to read and write, way easier to maintain and modify, and much more robust and efficient. And so we'll do this in the context of this expression tree processing app. And there's, as you'll see, there's a couple of different variants of this app. There's a GUI version that you can run on Android, which is available in written in Java, and you can get that at my website. And then there's also another version that's a command line version that's available in C++, and that's the one we're gonna focus on primarily. But basically what this is doing is it's providing a, a calculator-like capability. And of course, because the whole point of this is to demonstrate patterns and Gang of Four patterns, we're gonna apply many Gang of Four patterns in the implementation of this particular app. And the whole point of doing this is to provide a grounded context to discuss patterns where you can literally follow along pattern by pattern with the code and you can see how this stuff actually applies in practice. So let's talk about the expression tree processing app. What are its goals? What's its capabilities and so on? And, and of course, most importantly, what are the patterns that it embodies? And as you'll see, I'm gonna talk about these patterns in the context of the app at the moment, but every single pattern is much more broadly useful than expression tree processing apps. So that's just the case study to be concrete, to be real. It's by no means the limitations of what you can do with these cool capabilities. So an expression tree is a way of being able to describe algebraic expressions unambiguously. And if you draw out or you build a, an expression tree, then it's very clear what you mean by the computation that you're trying to perform to get a result. So for example, here's a, an expression tree that corresponds to minus five times the quantity three plus four. And we'll talk more about traversing this tree and evaluating it shortly. But if you look at this tree and you know binary trees and you know different traversal orders like post order and in order and so on, then you can very quickly realize that the yield of this tree is three plus four, which is seven times minus five. And so this allows us to be able to remove ambiguity without having to use extra parentheses. And of course the, the result is minus 35 because minus five times uh, three plus four times seven is minus 35. Also note how this way of describing and visualizing an expression tree shows us some other important design aspects. It shows us that some of the nodes in the tree have no children, the leaf nodes. Some of the nodes in the tree have one child, the unary nodes. Some of the nodes in the tree have two children, the binary nodes, and so on and so forth. So we're gonna be doing a bunch of things. I'm gonna be showing you a, an object-oriented decomposition of an expression tree. We're also going to look at a so-called algorithmic decomposition that's more kind of old school using C and C data constructor, data structure constructors like structs and so on. And we're gonna compare and contrast the pros and cons of kind of the old school algorithmic decomposition approach with the more effective and more generalizable and reusable and modular uh, and extensible and so on, object and pattern oriented versions of doing things. And of course, the, the point of this is to say, look at how much better the object oriented approach is that uses patterns rather than the old school algorithmic decomposition, which is very tightly coupled to a particular representation. Interestingly enough, you know, we've been, I've been doing objects now since 1986 or so. And uh, so that's, you know, almost 35 years worth of objects. There are still people out there who write code with algorithmic decomposition. It's becoming less and less over time, but it still is a, 
a, a tempting thing to do. And so one of the reasons why it's so tempting is because people don't show good models of how to do it other ways. So this is trying to, to break that perspective and let people think about things more abstractly and more object-orientedly. Uh, you'll also note that we combine object-oriented decomposition with generic programming wherever possible in our code. Another theme that pervades this discussion, it's not an A-list theme, but it's like a B-list theme, is the concept of scope, commonality, and variability analysis. And this is a method of software architecting and designing where you attempt to have as common as possible set of interfaces for things that are stable in your domain and have a set of common interfaces for things that vary in your domain. And if you can do this consistently, you can end up with a very nicely systematically reusable software architecture or software system. And that is sort of the holy grail of building software. And nowadays, there's many great examples of systematically reusable software developed using commonality and variability analysis. Uh, the Android platform is a great example. The Java platform is a great example. The, the iOS platform and Cocoa and various frameworks for developing in Objective-C or in Swift and so on. Those are also great examples. So all of these things are sort of the... Um, the exemplars of very well-designed software. And so learning about these concepts early in your, your career as a software developer is very valuable because it will come back to pay off down the road. Even if not every project you work on gives you the time or the opportunity to do things properly, knowing that it's possible to do things properly is very helpful. So there's a nice paper here that talks about commonality and variability analysis. And we will talk about this technique over and over and over again as we walk through the design and implementation in the context of our expression tree processing app. Of course, we're also going to see how all these abstract concepts like scope, commonality, and variability, and design patterns, and frameworks, and so on, actually get applied in our code. And we're going to do it with the features using STL concepts, sort of the generic functional concepts, as well as object-oriented concepts in C++. So here's a very simple example of this. This is showing kind of the C++ gang of four iterator pattern using a range-based, or, or sorry, using a, using a for loop. And uh, in this particular case, we're just using a for loop where we're going to get ourselves an iterator to the beginning of an expression tree and we're gonna keep iterating until we reach the end of the expression tree. And for every element in the tree, we're gonna go ahead and accept a print visitor to that element to print the contents. And that code is actually quite similar to what you need to do for your assignment number five, where you're going to be iterating through the universe and accepting a print visitor to print the contents of the universe and so on. Um, and so this is a way of using kind of the iterator pattern with a for loop. There's other ways of doing this using the STL for each algorithm. And this demonstrates a for each algorithm using the begin and end iterators on an expression tree, which are abstractions from our program. And in this case, we're going to be showing how you can use a, a Lambda function to do this properly. And uh, so just some other cool things that you can do here in order to, uh, in, in order to be able to demonstrate how these features work. So now that I've given you just kind of an overview of what we're going to be doing, what the goals of our case study are, and so on, let's start talking about the, the expression tree processing domain. And this is actually something that's known as domain analysis. And that's what people do when they're doing scope, commonality, and variability analysis. They analyze their domain, and they try to figure out what the key abstractions are in the domain so that they can then come and model those abstractions in the form of classes and objects and methods and algorithms and so on. So in our domain, we have expression trees that consist of nodes, and those nodes contain either operators or operands. And uh, I am kind of suspect you know what an expression tree is. So hopefully you learned about this in your data structures course. Hopefully you learned what a binary tree was. But if, if for some reason you need a refresh, take a look at the link at the bottom of the page. In our model, the operators, like plus and minus and 
multiplication and so on, are interior nodes in the tree. And you can see here that we have binary nodes and unary nodes in this particular tree. So the binary nodes would be things like multiplication and division and addition of subtraction or binary subtraction. And the unary nodes would be things like unary negation. And then we've also got operands, which are exterior nodes in the tree. And these are things that we often call leaf nodes. And so leaf nodes in our world correspond to actually values. So they would be like the value three or the value five or the value four or whatever. Operators can have different precedence levels, different associativities and different arities. You're probably familiar with the concept of precedence and associativity because you hopefully took that when you were in elementary school. Uh, arity is something that you may not be familiar with the term, but I guarantee you understand the concept. So let's talk about that briefly. So precedence defines which operator to perform first to evaluate a mathematical expression. So typically multiplication takes precedence over addition. So if you have um, five times uh, three plus four, then the five times three gets done first and then you add four to it. Unless you arrange your expression tree, as I've shown here, so that addition takes precedence over multiplication. And you can do that by defining the structure of your expression tree in such a way to make that happen. Or you can also put parentheses around stuff if you're doing it in, in everyday life. The operator locations in the tree unambiguously designate the precedence. So here you can see three plus four is performed before minus four, minus five times seven. And that's one of the virtues of an expression tree is that it shows that structure unambiguously. Associativity determines how operators of the same level of precedence are grouped in the absence of parentheses. So here you can see something like five plus three minus four, that groups as five plus three minus four, as opposed to five plus three minus four. And in that case, we would talk about addition and subtraction as being left associative. And then finally, arity, which, which is perhaps an unfamiliar term, but I assure you, you understand the concept. That's just a fancy way of saying, how many operands does an operator take? So as you can see, multiplication and addition operators have two arguments, so their arity is two, they're binary operators, whereas unary minus, or the negation operator, has one argument, so its arity is one. And all these things figure into our domain analysis, which will then ultimately influence the way that we lay out our classes using various patterns to guide us. The operands can be various types. They could be integers, doubles, variables, and so on. We're just gonna use integers in this particular case study, but it's easy to switch to doubles or floats or um, fixed point or whatever you need to do um, just by using things like generic, generic types or, or parameterized types. Another very important concept, which I, I think you also probably are familiar with, but I'll cover it quickly just in case you forgot, is the concept of traversal orders or evaluation. So you can go through a tree, an expression tree in various orders. So you can do so-called in-order traversal, which would be minus five times the quantity three plus four inside of parentheses. You can go through pre-order traversal, which is going to be doing a, a traversal where you visit the node as you go by it on the left-hand side. So you get times minus five plus three, four. You can do post-order traversal, which you visit the tree as you go by on the right-hand side. So that would be five minus three, four plus times. And then there's even something called level order traversal, which is not really mathematically viable, but is known as something called breadth first search. So you can see in that case, it would be times minus plus five, three, four. Okay, so those are different ways of traversing a tree, and some of them make it much easier to do evaluation of the tree in order to figure out what its values are. 